Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, as promised, this course is very broad. We've covered philosophy, engineering, computer science, physics. We'll do some chemistry when we get to soft robotics. We've done a fair bit of biology, psychology, biomechanics. The one topic we will not cover in this course is fine arts, not my area of expertise. It is the area of expertise for my colleague, Professor Jennifer uh, Carson in the art department. She is hosting uh, an exhibition uh, an exhibition next week, uh, you are all invited, uh, which explores the intersections between artificial intelligence and uh, fine art and creativity. In this course, we are kind of exploring how AI, in our case, an evolutionary algorithm could be creative. It can create things, in our case, autonomous and adaptive machines. But of course, there's lots of exciting other areas where AI is being applied to fine arts, Please feel free to stop by. There's an opening reception with free food, I've been told, uh, next Monday at noon. Um, pizza, workshops, and then the gallery itself is just open throughout next week. So if you can take a moment to stop by Williams Hall and check it out, I think you should find it uh, interesting. Jordan. The, uh, the talk last, the, uh, uh... Ah, yes. Thank you. Thank you. There is another talk going on today which I can never pronounce, the talk to octopus. How are we going to find this now? Vermont Complex Systems Center. Let's try this again. <laughs> I don't know how to spell it. Oh, goodness. It's apparently not very easily no, no, it is not easily Googleable, is it? OK, let's try and do this verbally. Uh, if you go on to Twitter and you find the Vermont Complex Systems Center uh, Twitter account, there is a talk today by Hiroki Sayama, who's at Binghamton University. He's visiting here in person. Uh, Jordan, do you remember off the top of your head when it is today? It's, it's sometime it's today. At it's at noon. OK, all right. All right, if you can find the place for us, that would be great. Um, Professor Sayama works in artificial life. If you remember in the first week of class, I showed you kind of the landscape of AI. We had robotics on one side, machine learning on the other. Evolutionary robotics on the embodied side is relatively, uh, is a sister discipline to artificial life. In evolutionary robotics, we're exploring intelligence as it could be, trying to create intelligent machines that maybe look and act differently from intelligent machines that exist here. Artificial life, their unofficial motto is, uh, artificial life, the unofficial motto is life as it could be, exploring different ways that life might take place. Professor Sayam is a world expert in artificial life. He's going to be speaking at noon today. E100 in this building. E100 in this building. Hiroki Sayama, E100, noon this building. That if you're, topic is how to make things evolve. How to make things evolve, perfect, okay. If you're free at noon, I highly recommend checking it out. Okay, lots going on this week, next week. Back to evolutionary robotics. We, are, uh, we just started in last time on lecture 13 and in our, uh, our new theme on looking at challenges or open problems in the field. We're going to look at the problem of modularity or lack thereof today. Typically, when you allow an evolutionary algorithm to play with networks, like neural networks that control a robot, left to its own devices, the evolutionary algorithm will tend to make the neural network less and less modular over time, which means as the evolutionary algorithm proceeds, any given mutation that alters that network that local change will probably have global repercussions because everything is not modular and interconnected. Uh, in lecture 14, which we'll probably get to today, we're going to look at the solution to a problem. The solution is neat and hyper neat. And the problem is the competing conventions problem, which we'll introduce shortly when we get to lecture 14. OK, that's where we're headed. You're working on the penultimate programming assignment, lecture nine, where you're parallelizing uh, your code. Slightly different ways that you need to parallelize it, depending on whether you're on a Mac uh, or a PC, Windows, everything going okay with lecture uh, with assignment nine? Questions, comments, all good? Okay, so back to lecture 13 and modularity. 
We started last time by pointing out maybe the obvious fact that in everything that we create, everything we engineer, including software engineering, uh, we try and make it modular. Uh, humans are smart, but not that smart. If we want to create something that's very complicated, it's easier for us to divide and conquer. Okay. Uh, we ended last time by talking about different kinds of modularity. There's different ways in which you can make a system a modular. We talked about structural and functional modularity uh, last time. Structural modularity is easier to think about. We have some overall network, and inside that network, we have modules that are more densely connected to one another, but little or no connections between modules in the network. Right? We saw this cartoon when we were looking at the small humanoid that was shaking the block up and down and forward and back and left uh, and right. Structural modularity makes sense in this case up to a point, but it's not very scalable. We have to keep adding new modules for every new thing that we want the robot to do. The, uh, the investigators who worked on that project came up with a different way of modularizing uh, the problem, which was not necessarily to have a structurally uh, structurally modular network, that a relatively densely interconnected neural network controlling the robot, but it was functionally modular, meaning it would fall, the network would fall into discrete dynamical patterns, up and down three times, left and right three times, but those patterns were relatively distinct, uh, distinct from one another, so we can view them as functional modules. Yeah? Okay. We're going to focus today on a solution uh, that, that's mostly focused on structural modularity. We're not going to say too much more about functional modularity today. Okay, so how does this apply to robotics? Well, obviously, if we have a task that we want a robot to perform, as we think about designing uh, the robot, we can, we can think about the task we can divide and conquer. We can break the task down into several uh, subtasks and then design different modules in the robot's neural network to controller, uh, a controller to allow those modules to perform that task. If you remember back towards the beginning of the course, we talked about subsumption architecture. If you have a Roomba at home, that's what's running inside uh, your Roomba. There's a bunch of structural modules inside the controller of a Roomba. Um, if it detects something on its right-hand side, it turns to the left and vice versa. There's no obstacles nearby, it explores. We have these different uh, modules. Alternatively, however, we could, again, in the spirit of evolutionary robotics, take a step back and try not to decide ourselves what the modules should be, but allow the evolutionary algorithm to create modules as it sees fit and if it sees fit to do so. Why might we want an evolutionary algorithm to do so? The reason is we might not be smart enough to know how to divide the task for the robot. If we imagine, if we try and put our shoes, if we try and put ourselves into the shoes of the robot and see the world from the robot's perspective, from the robot's sensors, often the world looks very different from the robot's perspective compared to our perspective. So imagine we want a robot uh, that's moving about an environment and there are cylinders and some cubes in the environment. From the distal point of view, distal meaning distant, we are viewing the robot and its environment from a distance. It looks pretty obvious at these two points in time that the robot here is driving past a cylinder and at this point in time the robot is driving past a block. But in these two instants of time, if we dive inside the robot and see the world from the robot's point of view, we're adopting the proximal perspective. Proximal meaning close. We're close to the robot. We're trying to see the world from the robot's point of view. If we assume this little cartoon robot here has these five distance sensors, from the robot's point of view, these two seemingly different situations or different environments are not different at all. I've obviously cooked this example. At the next time instance that the time instant that this robot moves, it's probably going to detect that these are different objects. But at this point in time, from the distal perspective, it looks like, okay, there's different situations. 
Maybe we want the robot to, do, to use module A to react to the cylinder, and we want the robot to use neural module B to react to the cube. There are obviously two different situations for this robot, and it makes sense from our point of view to divide and conquer and come up with different behaviors and different neural modules for the robot in these different environments. Thinking about thinking is misleading. The way it might make sense for us to carve up the world for the robot may not be appropriate for the robot itself. So we're gonna see an experiment in a moment where the investigators take a step back and allow evolution to tune not just the synaptic weights of a network, but also to tune to create modules inside that neural network if it's appropriate for the robot. Okay. This is a relatively, uh, a relatively old experiment. Um, this was pre-physics engines, so they created their own very simple 2D simulated world for the Kepra robot. Uh, in this case, they're going to ask the following question. How do we actually allow an evolutionary algorithm not just to tune the weights in a network, but also to tune the modularity in a network if it's useful for the robot? They picked a, a relatively simple task. They're going to have their Kepra move around in this simulated environment, and they're also going to place it in a real environment. The task for the robot is to pick up all the objects inside the arena, move them to the edge of the arena, and then drop these blocks outside uh, the arena. Pretty simple setup uh, in terms of sensors and motors from what we've seen before. The robot has six infrared sensors, which give distance information. And it has one light barrier sensor inside this gripper. So in this picture here, the robot is gripping a little sugar cube here. There's a very, very small beam of light inside this pincer. And when that beam of light is broken, the robot knows that it's holding on to something. If that beam of light is unbroken, it's not holding anything. We've got four motor neurons that correspond to two different motor primitives is a little bit different from how we've seen motor neurons operate before. Up till now, we've seen each motor neuron, whatever value arrives at the motor neuron, we send that value to a motor, and that motor interprets that number as a desired position, a desired force, a de desired velocity. In this case, we've got four motor neurons. So at every point in time, we're going to have four uh, values arriving at those four neurons. We're going to detect which of those four numbers has the greatest magnitude, and whichever of those four neurons has the greatest magnitude wins. At that point in time, whichever motor neuron wins triggers its corresponding motor primitive. If at a given point in time, the first of the four motor neurons has a higher value than the other three motor neurons, the left motor will spin the left wheel forward until some other motor neuron wins. If at a given point in time, the second motor neuron has a greater magnitude than the other three motor neurons, that second motor neuron wins, and the right motor spins the right wheel until some other motor neuron wins. If the third motor neuron wins, it triggers this motor primitive, object pickup. And if the fourth motor neuron wins, it triggers object release. Little bit of a, a little bit of a change from what we've seen before. So not all four of these actions are occurring in parallel. Any one of these four actions can sort of take control of the robot for a short period of time until one of the other motor neurons takes control. It's a little bit like some subsumption architecture. Make sense? OK. It's kind of an odd detail. It's relevant for the question they're asking here about modularity. And we'll see, see that uh, in a few slides. OK. All right, so I want you to take a moment and think about this task. You uh, are free to program the controller for this robot. Forget neural network controllers. You're just going to write a little Python script that's going to take sensory information and figure out what to do with these four motor primitives. One way to start thinking about the problem, as always, as humans, is to divide and conquer. Here's a, a possible decomposition that seemed intuitive to me. Obviously, if you're not holding a cylinder, you're not near a cylinder, be a Breitenberg vehicle. Explore your environment, avoid walls. If there's proximity on the right, turn to the left. If there's proximity on the left, turn to the right. 
Um, if nothing's really firing, go forward. Um, if there is something directly in front of you, then stop that particular Breitenberg vehicle, recognize the object, move to make sure that you're, that you're breaking the light barrier between the two fingers of the pincer, and then grab it and pick it up. You're now holding the object. Next module that makes sense is now you want to head for the walls. You don't want to ignore walls. You want to kind of do the opposite. Once you recognize a wall, move close to it and then release the object over the, the edge of the uh, arena. One, two, three, four, five, six modules. And then you could break some of these more complicated modules into other sub-modules. Make sense? Seems intuitive, right? Obviously, this is what evolution is going to discover if we allow an evolutionary algorithm to carve up a neural network into distinct modules. Hopefully you are all sufficiently trained by no, now to know that that is absolutely not what the evolutionary algorithm is going to do. Any guesses? How does it make sense to carve this task into simpler tasks? Tricky, right? Okay. All right. Uh, the investigators took uh, an interesting approach to tackle this problem. They kind of snuck up on this problem. They did this by evolving a series of five different neural networks inside the robot. They did a series of five experiments. Each experiment, they evolved different neural networks. These are the first four. I'll show you the fifth one on the next uh, slide. And as you can see, the neural networks get slightly more complicated over time. This is not scaffolding. They're not evolving with one neural network and then swapping in more complexity and continuing evolution. They're going to do, uh, I think they did 10 independent evolutionary trials uh, where the robot was controlled by network A, another 10 with network B, and so on. Hopefully you'll notice how these networks are being complicated over time. They have kind of a non-standard way of drawing these networks. They've got the motor neurons at the top the four motor neurons at the top, the seven uh, sensor neurons at the bottom. Usually we've seen sensors at the top, motors at the bottom, doesn't really matter. <laughs> These are Italian researchers. So whatever light barrier sensor is in Italian, that's why it's BL rather than LB. It took me a while to figure out why, why that was. Light barrier sensor, infrared sensors. Uh, network A, obviously pretty simple. We have just sensor neurons, just motor neurons, no hidden neurons. Network B, they introduce four uh, hidden neurons. Uh, in the paper, I think they refer to them as internal neurons. Internal and hidden neurons mean exactly the same thing. Okay. Network C, they still have their four hidden neurons, one, two, three, four, but they introduced recurrent connections. And again, they've kind of drawn this in an odd way. Uh, we've got two recurrent connections that are coming from the first two hidden neurons and connecting to the third and the fourth hidden neurons. What is B by you over A? What's, what's the potential usefulness of, in, of hidden neurons? Recall our discussion about neural networks. Uh, we, it introduces nonlinearities. So remember when we talked about neural networks, we designed a neural network to perform AND and OR. We tried to create a network that performed XOR, but we couldn't do it until we introduced hidden neurons because the XOR is a nonlinear function. So assuming that nonlinear transformations of sensor values into motor values is useful, assuming that's useful for this task, for this robot, then evolution should be able to produce more fit robots when it's evolving B networks for that robot than it is when it's evolving A networks for that robot. So far, so good? Okay, what about C? If we evolve robots uh, controlled by C and they do better than the robots that were evolved, uh, that were evolved and controlled by network B, what does that tell us? What are recurrent connections by you? Add some memory to the system. Memory, right? So if it's useful to remember in this task, then C should outperform B. What do you think? 
Is it useful here? Maybe, maybe. Okay. In D, in network D, the investigators came up with their own way to divide and conquer and built it into the network. You'll notice that there are two modules in this network. We have our seven sensor neurons down here, and each of the seven sensor neurons has a synapse connecting it to one of the four motor neurons in module A. So this entire set of synaptic weights, this is one neural module. And then we take the same seven sensor neurons and they are attached to a different uh, set of motor neurons over here. This is module B. So we have values arriving at the seven sensor neurons and those values are flowing down into two sets of four motor neurons. You can hopefully guess where this is going. Again, like subsumption architecture, depending on what's happening in the robot's environment, one of these two sets of motor neurons will grab control over the four motor primitives. One of the two modules will always be in control of the robot. In this case, the investigators assumed that there's, uh, there are two modules that make sense here. One module should control the robot when its gripper is empty. Presumably that's a module that should evolve to help the robot explore its environment, find a cylinder, find a cylinder and pick it up. And the second module is in control of the robot when its gripper is full. So when it actually has, when it has a cylinder, this module is controlling what the robot does. Makes sense, right? We're trying to clean up, throw these pegs out of the arena. The robot should do one thing when it's looking for a peg, and it should do something else when it has a peg. Seems blindingly obvious, right? If the investigators are right, then it should be easier to evolve, clean up the arena behavior for the robot when we're evolving uh, D networks compared to evolving any of the other three networks. So far, so good? Okay, fifth network. Take a deep breath. It's going to take a little bit to intuit what's going on here. This is a neural network designed by the investigators to allow evolution to make the neural network more or less modular. Okay, here we go. So sensor neurons are unchanged. We have our seven sensor neurons down here. You'll notice that there are now four distinct clusters of output neurons up here. And in each cluster, we have two selector neurons in black and two output neurons in white. These four clusters correspond to these four motor primitives, spin the left motor, spin the right motor, pick up and release, okay? We have a whole bunch of synapses that are flowing from the, from the sensor neurons to each of the four neurons in each of these four groups. So far, so good? Okay. All right, let's have a look at one of these clusters. Let's have a look at the one dedicated to the left motor. We have these two selector neurons. All of these neurons at the output layer, they're all floating point values. At a given point in time, if the left selector neuron's value is larger than the right selector neuron's value, that's the neural network trying to say, I want to use the left module associated with this motor primitive. So where is this left, where is this left uh, neural module? If we look at this white neuron here and trace back, we can see all these synapses going back to the sensor neurons. So I can try and trace this here. There's the left-hand module associated with the left motor primitive. If instead, at a given point in time, the right-hand selector neuron has a greater value than the left selector neuron, that's the neural network saying, I want to use the right module associated with this motor primitive. And here is that, here is that right-hand module associated with the left motor, motor primitive. So the selector neurons, as the name implies, by evolution tuning the synapses that are arriving at the selector neurons, evolution can tinker with 
which of these two neural modules controls the left motor under what conditions? Make sense? So the pair of black, I'm just going to say this differently, the pair of black neurons allows evolution to determine when two neural modules are used. And by tuning the synapses that arrive at the two white neurons, evolution is tuning what the robot does when it's controlled by one of these two neural modules. Same thing for the other three motor primitives. Questions? So the black ones are kind of like controlling which modules they use, and the white ones are like what drug they use? That's, a, that's exactly right. Thank you. You said it better than I, than I did. The, the selector neurons control it which module is being used, and the white neurons dictate what that module does to the robot. Exactly. OK. So we want to think now about how, what sort of freedom have we given to evolution? How many, we can ask, for example, how many modules are possible here? I've written this kind of as states, meaning which particular, neuro, which particular uh, neural module is in control at any given time. If we look at the first motor primitive, there are two possible states. Either the left module is in control or the right module is in control. Yeah, at a given point in time. At the same moment in time, in the sec second motor primitive, there are two possible conditions. Either the left neural module for this motor primitive is in control, or the right module is in control for, of that motor primitive. How many possible states are possible here? If we were to look at this neural network as it's controlling the robot over time, we're going to see either the left or the right module controlling each of these four motor primitives. How many total states are there? There's two possible states here, two possible states here at the same time. Not quite four. Two to the four. If we think about this in, in a binary sense, so zero equals the left module is in control, or what we're going to label this with zero if the left module is in control, one if the right module is in control, zero if the, this left module is in control, one if this module is in control, zero, one, zero, one. It's two to the four, which is, what is that, 1632? I haven't had enough coffee yet this morning. Thank you. 16 possible states. Yeah? So far, so good? OK. All right, so we just talked about uh, the fact of why they introduced this increasingly uh, complicated neural networks. It's going to allow us to investigate which of, these, uh, which of these neural complexities we've added in is actually useful. Are internal units useful? If they are, B should do better than A. If recurrent connections are useful, C should do better than B and A. If human-designed modularity is better, or at least these investigators' idea of how to divide and conquer, if that's useful, D should do better than C, B, and A. And if evolution is smarter than the investigators and came up with a different and better way to modularize the neural controller of the robot, then E should do better than D and C and B and A. All good? Makes sense? We wouldn't be talking about this paper if it wasn't the fact that E definitely wins. Yeah? OK. So evolutionary progress, as always, on the horizontal axis here. So we're looking at a fitness curve. We've got evolutionary time here. And we have fitness plotted on the vertical axis here. We haven't talked about what the fitness function is. Let's talk a little bit about how fitness is computed in this case. Uh, let's see, we're going, to, we're going to take each evolving controller, each neural network, we're going to drop it into the robot, and then we're going to evaluate the robot 15 different times. We're going to take the robot and put it at a random position, a different position and at a different orientation inside the arena, and then we're going to allow it to behave for what the investigators call 200 actions. 
So with the physical Keppra, this is probably like a tenth of a second. So it's a very short period of time. In the simulation, it's probably 200 time steps. They didn't really specify here, but they're allowing the robot to exhibit some behavior for some period of time 15 different times. Uh, and within each one of these epochs, if the robot manages to find, grab, carry, and drop a peg outside the arena before 200 actions, that's a successful epoch, and they move on to the next epoch. Yeah? Okay, so that's how they evaluate one controller. Here's a population of these controllers evolving over a thousand generations of evolutionary time. Remember, we have these five different neural networks. They did 10 independent evolutionary trials with each of these five controllers, leading to a total of 50 evolutionary runs. So far, so good? Okay. We can see that right off the bat, very early on in evolution, E did much better than the other four networks. And after a thousand generations, B, C, and D are starting to catch up. They're not quite there yet. And A did terribly. What can we conclude from that before we move on and look at more of the results? What's useful here for this task and what's not? Exactly. So the investigators were unlucky here. Their way of looking at the robot's world and trying to divide up that world for the robot failed. That was D. D's down here somewhere. Evolution came up with a better way of doing that. Doing that. That's the most important result from this paper, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Thinking about how to divide and conquer the world for a robot is misleading. Let an evolutionary algorithm or the robot itself decide. Yeah. A did particularly poorly. What does that tell us? Absolutely. So remember that A differs from B, C, D, and E in that it has no hidden connections. So for whatever reason, nonlinear transformations between sensor values and motor values was particularly useful in this task. It's not clear why, just, just was. Okay. Okay, uh, this was one of the few experiments we're seeing in this course where they actually took from simulation and transferred uh, to reality. So they took the best controller from each of the 50 runs, right? We have 10 times five uh, evolutionary trials. So we've got a total of 50 evolved controllers that were particularly good at controlling the simulated robot, getting the simulated robot to clean up the simulated uh, arena. They dropped those 50 neural networks into the physical Keppra, and, uh, and they recorded out of each of, the, each of the 10 controllers how successful it did at cleaning up the arena. And in reality, as in simulation, the robot controlled by evolved E networks did much better than the others. So not only did evolution come up with a good way of dividing up the robot's world, but that, however it divides up the robot's world, was useful for the robots, for the simulated robot's simulated world, and for the physical robot's physical world. Shortly, we're gonna start talking about sim to real transferal. This is particularly difficult. Uh, in this case, for whatever reason, they were successful. Okay. All right, fun part. We are going to try and understand how evolution decomposed this pro problem appropriately for the robot. First question is, is there a correspondence between evolved modules and distal behaviors? So what do I mean by that? We're going to look at a moment, we're going to look in a moment at one evolved E network, the one that was particularly successful. We're going to see the selector neurons switching which neural module is in control of the robot at a given time. And whenever there is a switch, from one neural module to the other while the robot is moving around in its environment, we are going to look from a distance. We're gonna watch the robot. We're gonna watch what it's doing in the arena and see if we see something different. If there was a correspondence, we might see, for example, that when this neural module is in control, that's when the robot is looking for uh, an object. 
and suddenly it switches to a different neural module when the robot grabs onto an object. As, you, as is clear from, from what I've said already, there is no correspondence. It's very difficult to see this correspondence. I'm going to show you the raw data in a moment. You can see whether there's a correspondence. Very difficult to see whether there is one or not. Okay. This particular evolved controller that we're going to look at, remember that there is a total of 16 possible states. It turns out that evolution only needs to use two states. What do we mean by that? What we mean is that it's only the right motor, motor primitive that is going to experience modularity. That the right motor is going to be controlled sometimes by its left module and sometimes by its right module. In the other three motor primitives, there is always one of the two selector neurons that has a greater value than the other selector neuron. So evolution did not create modularity inside of these other three motor primitives. So far, so good? Okay. All right. Okay, here we go. Hopefully you can see this all right. Let's start with uh, what the robot actually does when it's controlled by this E network. I will try and trace this for you because it's a pretty small picture. Uh, the line here is showing the trajectory of the robot moving. So I think it starts here, it moves here, it goes here, it moves here, it moves here, and at this point it comes into contact with this particular peg, picks it up, keeps driving, and drops this peg outside the arena. That's why it's now drawn as an outline. Drops the peg, uh, drops the peg outside the arena, turns around. Uh, sorry, I think it actually drives in the other direction. I got that wrong. Goes here, here, grabs this, uh, grabs this peg, drives here, drops the peg, turns around, goes here, grabs this peg, drops it out, and grabs this peg and gets it out of the arena and misses the fourth and the fifth peg. Okay, so pretty good, not perfect. Let's dive inside to the brain of this robot and see what it's doing, uh, wh what it's doing and how this modularity is making this task easier for the robot. Let's look at the top row to start with. This is mod or modularity. So they're showing over time here which of the two modules that controls the right motor is in charge. A black dash indicates that it's one neural module, white space, it's the other neural module in control. Remember here in horizontal time, we're looking at time inside the simulation, not evolutionary time. So we're watching the robot's brain flicking the mod modularity back and forth. If you scan your eyes down the rows, it is not clear that there is any corresponding pattern in any one of these rows that matches the pattern that you see in modularity. There's some similarity, but not identity. Each row that the investigators drew here was their attempt to find some aspect of the robot's behavior that seems to correspond with this modularity. First one is, uh, what is it currently seeing? Remember, it's got these infrared sensors. So is it currently seeing a wall or is it currently seeing uh, a target object? Uh, there is no, it doesn't seem that the modularity is controlling what the robot should do when it sees a wall or sees a target object. If it did, you would expect that these two rows would look very similar. Left motor, right motor, uh, pick up and release behavior that also the robot is doing things as it's moving about in the environment. None of those motor primitives seem to correspond very much to these different modules. We've got the raw sensor values themselves, infrared value one, infrared value two, infrared value six. Doesn't really seem to be much of a correspondence. Here's that light barrier, so that, that beam of light it's broken during this period, it's broken during this period, and it's broken during this period. What are those three broken periods telling us about the robot situation? Uh, that's current and holding one of them. Absolutely. So it's holding, uh, it's holding and carrying one of the objects and then gets rid of it. 
you'll notice there should be a spike in release behavior right here, right when it lets go. While it's holding one of the objects, it's the neural network is inhibiting the release behavior. You don't want to trigger the release behavior or else it's going to drop the target object that it's carrying. A, B through H here, these are different sub-behaviors that the investigators thought might be useful, right? Again, the poor humans are trying to divide up the world appropriately and failing. There's no clear correspondence between these modules and any given behavior, but there's a little bit of correspondence. Where is the correspondence? Uh, I3 kind of matches the darker lines in the modules. Yep, so I3 is pretty close, right? Whenever, right, whichever one, whichever module corresponds to the black ticks here seems to line up with I3. I have no idea what that means. I don't know why I3 is important. Other observations? Well, so I have a question. Sure. Um, for the modulation, that's specifically with the right motor. Yep. That was the only thing modulating, right? That's right. So it's in it's in this group here. It's only between the, this pair of selector neurons that the values are passing one another. In the other three pairs of selector neurons, one is always greater than the other, which is evolution's way of saying I don't need modularity for those other motor primitives. So technically, we have five different modules. Correct. We have five different modules. One module for this, one module for this, one module for this, and a fourth and fifth module for this motor primitive. And fourth and fifth module are used under different circumstances. But what those different circumstances are, from our point of view, very difficult to see. I presented this, this experiment dozens of times now, if not hundreds of times. I still can't figure it out. Another great example of why thinking about thinking is misleading. L like us, evolution says, yes, modularity is useful. It makes sense to divide and conquer, to create different modules inside the brain of the robot, but definitely not in the way we might carve it up. Another difference in the way that evolution has carved up the brain compared to the way we might do it is you'll notice that the modules are not contiguous. They switch on and off very rapidly. Typically, when we think about modularity, at least when we think about it behaviorally, we think about the robot is doing something as it carries the target object. Module A is in charge for a contiguous period of time. Now, the robot has dropped the target object, and it's going to go look for another one. So now there is another module, module B, that's controlling the search for a new target object. And B is in control for a contiguous period of time. Right? Very odd for us, usually, to think about modularity switching back and forth very, very quickly. Uh, it kind of makes sense that the left motor and the right motor, one of them is only going to be modular, because with the left motor in this case, you can just keep going in a continuous pattern that exactly copies the right motor, and then have turn and be to the right motor. Yeah, that's true. Right? We could set the left motor to do one thing more or less constant. Mm -hmm. Remember that it's a little more complicated than that. Just because the left motor is not the left, the spinning of the left wheel, that motor primitive, because that wasn't modularized, it doesn't mean that the wheel cannot do different things, right? Yeah, okay. Okay. All right, I think in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip over some of this and just look at this last analysis that they did. This is a, an analysis very much like the ones we saw when we looked at minimal cognition the little space invader robot that moved along the bottom of the, of the screen. They wanted to expose uh, one evolved e-controller to conditions it never saw during evolution. How did they do that? Uh, how did they do that? They took the robot, they took the robot and uh, they, they made sure its gripper was empty, so they started the robot without holding a target object, and they placed it uh, very close to the wall, five units away from the wall, 25 units away from the wall, 45 units away from the wall. So they're going to do a whole bunch of placements of the robot in the environment at different, uh, at different positions and orientations. Closer to the wall, further away from the wall. The horizontal axis here is reporting the angle of the robot relative to the wall. So zero represents the robot is facing the wall directly. 
Uh, as we move to the left here, the robot is rotating to the left, so the wall is now on its right. If we move to the right here along the horizontal axis, the robot is being placed uh, so it's facing to the right and the wall is on its left. So if we think about the pixel at x equals zero here and y equals zero, that's the robot facing directly the wall directly and it's directly in front of the wall. If we pick another point here, uh, let's see up here, this is the robot turned 90 degrees to the right of the wall and it's 45 units away from the closest wall. So we can imagine a whole bunch of pixels here that correspond to different initial conditions. And then they're going to color that pixel based on what the robot does under those conditions. They're gonna paint the pixel white if the robot does the right thing. So if the robot, doesn't matter whether the robot is close to a wall, away from a wall, facing the wall, turned away from the wall, if its gripper is empty, don't do anything. Let's look at the same evolved, uh, same evolved network, but now they start, by putting, they, they start by putting a target object in the robot's hand. So it starts by holding an object and they do the same thing. They place the robot near the wall, away from the wall, facing the wall, away from the wall, and look in all of those initial conditions, what does the robot do? The gray pixels here are conditions, initial conditions that trigger the robot to release the peg, release the object. So focusing just on this panel for a moment, does the robot do the right thing? I'm giving you a strong hint here by telling you it never makes a mistake. So yes, it does the right thing. All the white pixels out here is it doesn't drop the peg. It's too far from the wall up here and far to the left and far to the right. It's turned too far to the left or too far to the right away from the wall. It's only when it's close to the wall that it drops the peg. It fails to drop the peg when it's right in front of the wall and facing the wall. The peg is far outside the arena. This would be the perfect opportunity to drop the peg, but it doesn't. But still, the network does the right thing. How, how do we reconcile those two facts? Uh, maybe it doesn't already drop the object. Absolutely, right? So it's, it's, holding, it's holding the object, and during evolution, in order to get to this uh, position and orientation, it would have had to hit one of these other surrounding conditions and it already dropped the peg, right? So, so far, this network is doing exactly the right thing. Same evolved network. They're gonna put it in all these different initial conditions, but now they're going to determine what it does when its gripper is empty, and there is a cylinder nearby, far away. The robot is turned away from the target object or facing the target object right, right on, and the black pic pixels correspond to conditions that triggered the pickup motor primitive. And again, we can see that the robot is doing exactly the right thing. Only when the, cylinder, only when the robot is facing the cylinder directly and the cylinder is close, does the robot try and grab it and pick it up. So far, so good. When the robot is holding a cylinder and there is a second cylinder nearby, far away, to the robot's left, to the robot's right, the robot, no matter what, ignores that cylinder. It neither triggers the release behavior in gray or triggers the pickup behavior in black. Excellent. Yeah? Okay. In the, bottom, uh, uh, in the bottom four panels here, they're looking at a second evolved e-controller, which was pretty good, but it makes a few mistakes when it's exposed to these new conditions. Where? Where in the plots are we seeing the error occurring? Uh, when I have the cube in its hands already, it drops it if it sees another cube. Absolutely, right? So gripper is full, it's holding a cylinder, and it sees another cylinder very close by on the robot's right, and that triggers it to drop the cylinder. What it does after that point is not clear. I want you to focus on this part of this plot, and I'm going to go back and forth between these. This figure, what it's showing, each black pixel corresponds to a position and orientation 
that that controller experienced inside the robot during evolution. White correspond to conditions that that controller never experienced during evolution. So it's making mistakes under these conditions, but it never saw that particular condition during evolution. It was never carrying a cylinder and saw a cylinder slightly to its right or slightly to its left. No? Okay. All right, so at the end here, uh, we can conclude basically this experiment was a success. They found evidence supporting their hypothesis that evolution can carve up the robot's world better than we can. They actually also created a pretty nice evolutionary robotics experiment where evolution has freedom to do at least four different things. The first thing is to determine what sensor states are experienced while moving. This is often a subtle point that we haven't really talked about before. During evolution, evolution can tune the neural network so that the robot only experiences a subset of all possible sensations that it could experience. The robot doesn't go everywhere and do everything. So the robot, the evolution is kind of constraining what the robot sees or senses. And then in the other three cases, through mutation and evolution and uh, through evolution, it's determining what that neural network does under those conditions. So it's determining whether modularity should be uh, included and how to include modularity, what neural modules exist. It does that by tuning the synaptic weights that flow from the sensor neurons to the selector neurons, right? In three, evolution is also determining what those modules cause the robot to do by tuning the synaptic weights that connect, uh, tuning the weights of the synapses that connect the sensor neurons to the motor neurons. Uh, sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, sorry, that's number three here. What, what, what it does, what triggers, what situations trigger those modules? by tuning the synapses that flow from the sensor neurons to the selector neurons. So what triggers changes in use of the modules? And then number four, what do those modules do? Okay. Any questions about that before we push on? Okay, a nice win for evolutionary robotics here uh, back in the late 90s. However, modularity or lack thereof is still a challenge. If you've taken a machine learning course and talked about convolutional neural networks, the kernel inside a convolutional network is a type of module. Who determines the, the kernel or the size of the kernel or the skip rate, all those other parameters? It's usually still the human investigator. Even in state-of-the-art machine learning today, Human investigators, human researchers are struggling with or trying to, trying to include appropriate modularity for the neural network rather than letting the machine learning algorithm itself determine modularity. Still, still kind of an open problem in the field. Okay. All right, that's all we're going to say about modularity uh, for now. We're going to switch and talk about NEAT and HyperNEAT. These are two algorithms that are very common in evolutionary robotics and evolutionary computation. If you've taken the evolutionary algorithms class here, you, will, you have or will hear about the NEAT algorithm. The NEAT algorithm was originally de designed to solve a particular problem, an open problem in the field at that time, which is known as the competing conventions problem. Let's have a look at the problem first before we have a look at NEAT, the solution to this problem. Let's imagine we have two neural networks here. Let's imagine that each neural network has the same architecture, two input neurons, three hidden neurons, one output neuron. We're going to assume that we're evolving populations of these networks. And inside this population at a given point in time, we have these two networks. Each of these two networks has started to evolve the weights of these synapses so that each of the three hidden neurons computes subfunction A, B, and C. Remember when we talked about neural networks and we were designing a neural network to solve the XOR problem? 
in the XOR problem, we needed two hidden neurons, and those two hidden neurons, depending on how we, or we tuned the synaptic weights, arriving at those, those two hidden neurons, so that those two hidden neurons computed two subfunctions, AND and OR, and then the synapses that connected those two hidden neurons to the output neuron was determining how to combine those sub, two subfunctions. Let's assume these neural networks are evolving to solve some problem, and that problem requires the solving of three subproblems, A, B, and C. Yeah? Okay. Assume further at this point that we're quite far along in the evolutionary process, and these two networks are getting better at solving A, B, and C. In the first network, the first hidden neuron is computing, is doing a pretty good job of solving A. In the other network, it's the third hidden neuron that's, that's getting better at solving subfunction A. Again, going back to our XOR neural network, it didn't matter in that network whether the first hidden neuron or the second hidden neuron was computing the AND function, right? Okay. Imagine further that, uh, in this case, this network is doing really well at A and B and not so good at C. Imagine that the second parent, uh, the second parent network is doing pretty well at C, but not so good at A and B. Wouldn't it be great if we could cut out A and B from the first parent, because it's doing pretty well at A and B, and combine it with C from the second parent, second parent is doing a good job of C, and bring those two pieces together. We haven't talked about this too much so far in this course, but we're going to look at uh, recombination in, uh, in this experiment, in the NEAT experiment. We're gonna try and combine or cut pieces of genotypes and combine them together. And if we cut them just right, some of the times we should be able to bring together the best of both worlds. Okay. We're gonna simplify our lives for a moment and assume that we're gonna cut these networks with a straight line. We can't cut with a curved line for a moment. Imagine where you might place a straight line so that you'd cut these, new, these networks in such a way that you could combine A and B from network one with C from network two. Obviously, this is a cooked example so that you cannot do so. Imagine that we place our straight line between the second and third hidden neurons in both networks. We're gonna cut this network in half here, and we're gonna cut this network in half here. If we do, we get A and B and all its synapses from here, and it gets combined with A from the second parent, and we get one child that has A, B, and A. The first hidden neuron computes A, the second hidden neuron computes B, and the third hidden neuron computes A again, right? Not only did we not combine uh, the good pieces together, we actually lost one of the necessary components, C. This crossover event produces a second child, which is uh, B and C from this parent with C from this parent. So in this child down here, its first hidden neuron and all its synapses, it inherits from its second parent. And its second hidden neuron computes B from over here and C from over here. Again, we have a child that is missing a necessary component. You can play this game indefinitely and you will never end up with something that combines A, B, and C. We could get fancy and allow the cut to be some complicated curve where maybe, just maybe, we could find a way to cut these two in such a way that we combine the good A and B with the good C from parent two. Yeah? Okay. Macs are great computers, PCs are great computers, but they have pros and cons. Wouldn't it be great if we could cut your laptops in half and glue the good part of a Mac with the good part of a PC? It sounds so ridiculous, right? This is often the case when we're trying to evolve or optimize machines or neural networks. If we're 
evolving populations of them, it's unreasonable to assume that one is getting better at all the components simultaneously. It's usually the case that different elements in the population are getting better at different subtasks. Wouldn't it be great if we could introduce a crossover event that would at least increase the probability that sometimes, sometimes, we're able to bring together the, the best of both worlds? Yeah? Okay. The NEAT algorithm is designed to do exactly that. The NEAT algorithm is actually used now in neural networks and evolutionary robotics. It's used in lots of other uh, branches of AI. It's kind of matured and has shown that it's useful in other ways. We're going to focus mostly today on its origins, where it started, which was as a solution to the competing conventions problem. Any questions about the competing conventions problem before we move on? So far, so good? OK. Here's what genotypes look like in NEAT. They are a set of, not a vector, but a set of a pair of two lists. These lists can grow and shrink in length, as we'll see in a moment. They are not fixed length, like your vectors are in your parallel hill climber. The phenotype is going to be a neural network. Remember, the phenotype is the thing that's encoded by the genotype. The genotype is the blueprint. And the phenotype is the thing that's built from the blueprint. These two, uh, these two lists correspond to the nodes or neurons in the network. And the second list corresponds to the connections or the synapses in this uh, neural network. The NEAT algorithm, obviously, is kind of neat, as you'll see in a moment. But it's an acronym for neuroevolution. We're evolving neural networks. And we are going to augment or NEAT is going to augment the topologies of these networks as we go. What does that mean? The topology is another word for the neural architecture, how many neurons there are and how they're wired up. We are going, the NEAT algorithm is not just going to tune the weights of neural networks, it is also going to be able to add and remove neurons and synapses. It is going to be able to augment or change the neural topology of the neural network. OK, Okay. so let's have a look at what this genotype actually does. Um, the node genes down here, you can see encode descriptions of the neurons themselves. So this particular genome in the first list, it is encoding all the neurons. So in this case, we have five elements in the list corresponding to five nodes here. Inside each element, there's a tag indicating the type of that neuron. So we have three sensors, one hidden and one uh, output in this case. And there is a number associated with each of these neurons. The next list, every element in the list, includes all the information for a single synapse in the network. So the first element in the connection genes or the synapse genes here indicates the first synapse should connect neuron one to neuron four. It should have a synaptic weight of 0.7, and it is enabled. It's turned on. It also has uh, an innovation number associated with it. We'll come back to the innovation number in a moment. Second synapse should connect neuron 2 to neuron 4, neuron 2 to neuron 4. It should have a weight of minus 0.5. It's turned on. The third synapse, which should connect neuron 2 to neuron 5, has been disabled by a mutation. So mutations can hit any of the elements and any of the tags in these elements and change them. One of the neat things about NEAT is it can turn on and off synapses. So in essence, we have a little bit of junk DNA in here. I think we mentioned this already. There's a fascinating debate that's been going on for many years now in genetics about whether or not your DNA has junk in it. As far as we know at the moment, there are certain parts of your genome that never seem to be expressed. They never seem to play a part in transcription or translation into proteins. Seems kind of odd, right? Why would we be carrying around all this extra junk if it doesn't do anything? Ah, good question. There are those that believe it is, that it's like the appendage, that it was useful in the past, and evolution just hasn't 
completely removed it yet through mutations, right? So this synapse is actually a vestigial synapse, meaning maybe the synapse that connected neuron two to neuron five there, it was enabled in one of the ancestors of this network, and maybe it was useful, but it got turned off and it's not really used anymore. So it's possible that junk DNA is also vestigial like our uh, appendix. Yep, there is a more subtle argument you can make, not just that something that is currently disabled is still there because it was useful in the past, but it, that it will potentially be useful in the future. And we don't have time to go into that, the, that line of argument. It's a tricky one because evolution is blind. Evolution cannot see into the future and know that your great, great, great grandchild would probably do well if they had the particular gene that's in you at the moment, but turned off. It'll be turned off and it'll be turned on in four generations. Let's keep it around. Evolution is smart, but it's not that smart. So if something is potentially useful in the future and evolution cannot see in the future, why is it still here? You know? It's a fascinating discussion. Go ahead and Google junk DNA if you're interested. It's a, it's a debate that's been raging for a long time. It's still going. Uh, in this case, uh, whether or not it's helpful or not doesn't really matter for our purposes. We're going to focus on how NEAT solves the competing conventions problem. There's a bunch of other details like this enabled, disabled uh, detail, which, we, which we're not going to talk about today. Okay, so let's see. We've got some other synapses, 3 to 5, 4 to 5, and 5 to 4. We can see that some of the synapses that can be encoded can also be recurrent. Yeah. All right, so this is, this is just a snapshot of one genotype, one phenotype. Let's look at mutation in NEAT. NEAT is evolving a population of uh, neural networks. Some neural networks die off, some survive. Those that survive, the evolutionary NEAT makes a copy of that network. And when it does, it introduces random mistakes, right? It introduces mutations. Different kind, there are more mutations that are possible in NEAT than in a traditional evolutionary algorithm. What I'm plotting now is a genotype and phenotype down here. This is only the uh, synapse list. We're not going to look at the neuron list. There is a neuron list here. I just haven't, haven't shown it. At this point in time, this particular neural network has four enabled synapses and one disabled synapse. One particular mutation operator is to actually add a new synapse. So we flip a coin, we decide coin comes up uh, heads, we're gonna add a synapse. We add a synapse, the most recent synapse was synapse six, so the new synapse becomes synapse seven. We pick some random integers, we pick three, we pick four, which indicates that this synapse is now gonna connect neuron three to neuron four. We have augmented the topology of this neural network through mutation. The child has a different topology or a different architecture from its parent. Another mutation here might actually add a new node so, or a new neuron. Again, I'm not showing the neuron list, but the mutation here is adding a new neuron, neuron six, neuron six, then uh, also another mutation perhaps adds a new synapse that connects neuron three to neuron six. So we have a new uh, synapse eight and another new synapse nine, which connects neuron six to neuron five. So mutations can add neurons, can add synapses. Other mutations can delete synapses. They can delete an element from this list. We have more familiar mutations. A mutation may hit one element in this list and change the synaptic weight of that element as well. Okay. So far so good? Okay. The fun part and the part that NEAT was designed for is to make crossover possible. In NEAT, it is possible for a crossover event to grab two parent neural networks that you see up here cut them, combine their pieces together, and produce a child. 
that looks similar to the parent. If you look at this network, it kind of looks like this one, it kind of looks like this one. It resembles both its parents. Most importantly, when you run sensor values or input values through this, neuro, through this network and you look at the output values, that behavior, that input-output transformation looks similar to the input-output transformations uh, exhibited by parent one and by parent two. So the child, the children, the child networks in NEAT tend to look and act similarly to their parents. So far so good? Okay, how does NEAT make that happen? The intuition here, the, the brilliant part of NEAT is to not try and line up parents or cut them based on their structure, but based on their function. So let's go back to our cartoon example here, A, B, and C. A is at different places in these two networks. So if we try to cut things so that uh, only one of the left hand, uh, one, only one of the left hand hidden neurons and its synapses ends up in the child, that's the wrong way to do things. We don't want to line things up by structure and make sure only that one piece gets into the child. That's how our chromosomes work, right? For a given gene, you have two alleles, and we try and make sure that just one of those alleles is contributed by each parent. It's not how NEAT works. It doesn't line up networks based on structure. It lines them up based on function. It tr NEAT tries to estimate what different parts of the network are doing. So again, if we take another step back, we go back to our XOR function. We had AND and OR. We can look at the values that are coming out of those neurons and look to see which are similar. Right? We can look at their behavior and use that. Right? If we open up a Mac and we open up a PC, the CPU is going to be in different places. Assume you don't know how to recognize a CPU inside a Mac and a PC. You might be able to put clamps onto this weird square-shaped thing and notice that the inputs and outputs of these two different squares at two different places inside these two different laptops are producing more or less the same kind of input-output transformations. Those are the two things in which only one of those two should be contributed into the child machine. So far, so good. One piece that's tricky about this is that would be extremely computationally intensive. We'd have to look at all the input-output transformations and compare every pair of neural parts inside this network. It would be extremely computationally intensive. As you now probably have personal experience, evolutionary algorithms are computationally expensive. Can we do it in a smarter way? We got two minutes left. So I'm just going to give you the intuition. NEAT is able to estimate similar function inside of two different neural networks by tracing the evolutionary ancestry of those two parents back to the same common ancestor. Yeah? As we trace back from two parents, we go back to the common ancestor. We then go forward again from that common ancestor to the two parents and we watch each part of those, we watch each part of those networks and we look to see is there a split event? Is there a particular part of the network that got split and the same piece got put into two great, great, great grandparents? Those two similar pieces that came, that were copied from the same piece in the common ancestor ended up in the great grandparents, grandparents, parents, now we know, even if those two pieces are at different places in the two parents, those two pieces were evolution are evolutionarily derived from the same common piece inside the same common ancestor. Even if we don't look at the input-output patterns of those two pieces, we can be pretty sure that they have similar function. We mentioned, uh, we mentioned, uh, or we mentioned this idea a little bit earlier. But we're tracing this common common ancestor, we're tracing this piece from the common ancestor into the two parents, and that's though that those two pieces, we're going to ensure that only one of those two pieces ends up in the child. Question. So the neat algorithm does require the visual of all from the same parent at some point? 
Exactly. If there are two parents and they do not have a common ancestor, this trick doesn't work. Yep, good point. We're out of time. You have a quiz due tonight. You're working on assignment nine. Have a great rest of your day, rest of your week. See you next week.